Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Breaking Into Cybersecurity. I'm Mark Davis from Full Stack Cyber Bootcamp. And with me, I have Corey Greenwald, also from Full Stack Cyber Bootcamp. Hey, Corey. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Good, good. You're back from a little a little vacay. I thought vacation vacay. canceled during COVID. I know, right? I uh, I I played vacation between uh, my bedroom and uh, the kitchen. I got I got <laughs> a good amount of food. Maybe got a little bit of air. That was it was pretty wild. I'll tell you that. So it's a simulated vacation. Simulated vacation. Much of what yeah. we do is simulated, isn't it? So uh, yeah, I, I I think these days. Um, you know, we've got a really, really cool topic uh, today, Corey. W what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, so we're, we're kicking off a new series here, right? Um, uh, breaking into cybersecurity. Uh, and this one, you know, day in the life. Uh, we'll be interviewing people who fill all different kinds of roles in cybersecurity, like uh, cybersecurity analysts and uh, security engineers, security architects, uh, all the way up to the top, you know, uh, and, the, and the chief, you know, information security officers. Uh, and so today we're really going to, uh, um, you know, hear a little bit about what, what they'd like to do and what they do in their day job, um, what they like about their jobs that they maybe don't like. Uh, get you really excited kind of to hear a little bit of insight from the community. And so today we're going to kick it off um, uh, by, by talking about a day in the life of the chief information security officer, right? The, the, the CISO. So, uh, yeah, that, Really yeah, we're starting at the top. Starting at the top. We're That's starting true. at the top. This this sounds actually really cool because you know a lot of students who come through full stack cyber boot camp or who are considering going into cyber, uh, you know, a day in the life is kind of a mystery. You know, in, right. in terms of what what you would actually be doing and what does it look like when you arrive at the office? What are you doing during the day? Um, so I think this will give a lot of insight for people. You know, considering going into this field to see what it actually lo looks like to work um, in cybersecurity. Uh, and we've got a, a great guest to start us off with day in the life and with CISOs talking about CISOs. As a matter of fact, this person probably knows more CISOs uh, than anyone else I, I know. And in fact, he's a, he's a former CISO, right? He's he, now okay. he's, he's CEO of security scorecard, but before that he was a, a CISO. As a matter of fact, let me read you his official bio. Okay. Please. Yeah. Doc, Dr. Alexander Yampolsky, Dr. Ooh, Alexander, doctor. there's some respect That's around here, okay, is a globally recognized cybersecurity innovator, leader, and expert. As co-founder and CEO of Security Scorecard, Yampolsky has led the company since its beginnings in 2013 to become one of the world's most trusted cybersecurity brands. Prior to founding the company, Yampolsky was a hands-on CTO at CinchCast and Blog Talk Radio, the largest, the largest online talk radio and podcast hosting platform. And prior wow. to that, he was a CISO at Guilt Group, where he actually worked with, you, this is a trivia question, you know who he worked with at, at Guilt Group? I, I don't. That would be, I guess I would fail this trivia question. Is, you is, failed, you failed. Ep yeah, epic fail. He, he worked with David Yang, co-founder. Oh, David team. Yang. I know that guy. Yeah. Right. You definitely, you you definitely know, know that guy. That's, yeah. You do know that guy. <laughs> So he was CISO at Guilt Group, where he managed all aspects of IT infrastructure security, secure application development, and PCI compliance. Mm -hmm. Yampolsky has a BA in math and, a, and computer science from NYU and a PhD in cryptography from Yale. That's, that sounds well, pretty easy. I've PhD heard of Yale. Yeah, it's, from Yale. It's, it's familiar. Yeah. You know what? Why, why, don't, we, why don't we bring him in? Let's, let's Alex, hear it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's yeah. meet him. Hey, Alex. How you doing? Alex. Oh, wait, you're muted? Is your, is your mic off? Hey, Mark. Be, hey, nice to be with you guys. Yeah, yeah, we meet again. My wife likes to joke that I'm a doctor, except I don't help people. <laughs> <laughs> you're not a helpful doctor. I mean, you know, you're, 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 a, you're, a, you're a surgeon of, like, I don't know, uh, like, you know, security or something. I don't know. That's, you could you know, get in there and, I don't know, cut things up. I don't know. It's yeah. not working. Let's move on. Let's move on. It's Alex, <laughs> Alex, you are CEO of Security Scorecard. What, when, before we dive in here, what is what is Security Scorecard? Sure. So Security Scorecard is a company uh, that I started back in 2014, and it came out of a realization that I had back when I was a CISO that there's got to be a way to measure cybersecurity. There's no way to really know which company is more secure or less secure. So we had an idea that there's got to be a way to pick up signals about companies out there from outside and reduce those signals into a rating, a letter grade score, ABCDF representing resilience of a company. Mm. 
I like that. You're, you're the focus on simplicity. I think a lot of developers even, you know, go through sort of, uh, you know, tasks of data aggregation and coming up with a result. And especially with security being so complex and so multifaceted, trying to digest it down to just a, a letter, I think, you know, really simplifies the process for a lot of a lot of people looking at third party tools, et cetera. It's cool. Very and cool. also Keeping it simple is actually one of the core security principles out there. You gotta keep things simple. That's a good. Uh, that's actually a good thing to keep in mind for all aspiring security professionals. <laughs> yeah, that's and actually, a, Security uh, Scorecard has a very nice UI and very nice visual interface, right? In 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 terms of trying to k- take complex data sets and make it simple and be able to you know uh, make sense of it. That's exactly the point. We wanted to come up with a simple way for people to rate and measure relative security, and then teach them how they can improve it and uh, get better. Yeah. All right. So so how did you get here? Like what was your 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 you know, where did you start? How did you get, you know, you had a background in math and computer science. Like how, what path did you take that led you to uh, sort of running security scorecard? Take us through it. So, I think the most important piece of advice is uh, for anybody, you got to do what you love. You got to be passionate about what you do. Because if you're passionate about the career that you pursue, then you're going to outwork everybody else. You're going to study on the weekends. You're going to be excited excited getting out of bed, going to work. you got to love what you do. And for me, my love of cybersecurity began at an early age. When I was 12, uh, a friend of mine brought me a video game called Prince of Persia by Broderbond. Uh, but uh, he infected that game with a computer virus. <laughs> and I was like, what is it? I open up a game... And good friend. Sudden, yeah, yeah, good friend, right? Uh, a good friend at the time. But um, I wanted to get back at him, so I wanted to learn how do the computer viruses work. And I started, uh, I started reading about computer security, and I got really fascinated with the concept of how, you make, how developers make programs behave. Similarly, hackers make the programs misbehave. And I was right. really fascinated by this concept, and then I uh, – that kind of that – that made it an easy choice of what I would major in college and graduate school. I finished my PhD at Yale, and uh, um, I loved being in academia, but I also wanted to build things. I liked to, I didn't want to just publish papers. I wanted to build things and make them come true into the real world. And after I finished Yale, uh, I went to companies like Microsoft, Oracle, Goldman Sachs, where I led a team responsible for all of their authentications and entitlements, spent a number of years there then got hired as a first chief security officer at Guild Group, uh, where I built their security from when there were 200 people to when there were 2,000 people. And then a couple of years later, I started Security Scorecard out of the experiences and pain points uh, that I had as a CISO. Right. Well, you know, Alex, that's all well and good, but uh, you're going to leave us hanging? You're not going to tell us if you got your friend back from Prince of Persia? Uh, I don't talk to him. That I don't talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's keeping him, uh, you know, in suspense. One day, one day yeah. he knows he'll, he'll get him back. So not, um, not yet. It. Right, yeah. right. So let's zone in, I guess, on that that CISO portion, right? Like, you know, you worked your way through sort of a lot of different cyber jobs along the way. Um, what exactly is a, a CISO, I guess, is, is really, uh, I think, what we should zone in on here. Like, what did you do in that role? So um, on day one, I show up at Guild Group. Uh, at the time, it was a couple of hundred people, but I just, you know, I just got recruited as a first CISO. That was my first CISO role at Guild. Uh, CISO stands for Chief Information Security Officer. And so I show up in the office, kind of being my uptight self, wearing a suit at 8 o'clock in the morning. Nobody wore a suit in a startup. Uh, and, I ask <laughs> my boss, and, I, and I ask my boss, I'm like, listen, I'm really excited to be here. Like, what should I focus on? What am I supposed to do as a CISO? And he says, well, uh, you go you go figure out what you do. Like, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to give you an advice. You got to do two things. Number one, you keep us out of jail. And number two, you keep us out of the news. <laughs> My high-level mission is I got to keep us out of jail and I got to keep us out of a newspaper for the wrong reason. Uh, but the job of a CISO, the job of a chief information security officer is to manage risk, right? Like the job of a CISO is he or she is responsible for making sure that the company's uh, risk management practices are up to the par. So the CISO oversees cybersecurity 
architecture to make sure that developers write secure code. He makes sure uh, to put proper IT policies in place to make sure that uh, uh, people are trained and people know what to do and what not to do. And ultimately, being a CISO is a risk management exercise where uh, you try to mitigate business risk. And the risk is never mitigated, so a lot of the time you have to do a compromise. But ultimately, being a CISO is a management job and also a risk mitigation job. That's really what being a CISO is all about. Mm. So who does the CISO report into and what kind of people report into the CISO? Sure. So um, so who the CISO reports to is a fairly contentious topic because uh, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you rewind the clock to five, five years ago or more, typically the CISO would report to a CTO or CIO. Occasionally the CISO would report to a CFO, chief financial officer, but the CISO would report either to CTO, CIO, or maybe a CFO, or or anywhere else they would put him or her. Uh, it was not an executive level role. Right now, uh, CISO and the heightened awareness of companies and the importance of data breaches actually began to elevate the CISO to uh, executive ranks. So there's more and more cases where the CISOs be, uh, report to a chief risk officer or to a CEO or to another business unit leader, but a CISO is beginning to enter the executive ranks in many companies. Five mm. years ago or more, that was not the case. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think like, you know, this is what tells you that this field has been on the brink of like, you know, I I, I worked as a web developer for, for, for a while before this, and I can tell you that, you know, security was there, but it wasn't there. It wasn't in your face. You weren't thinking about sort of, you know, all of these, these uh, sort of, you know, everything you did in the impact on security posture of your organization and, and sort of where your exposure was. And you mentioned risk management. Management, right, like um, I, I think that until you know very recently, we weren't thinking of like not not everyone had an. It was sort of this thing that happened in the background, and you know now you're even seeing at the highest level, like you just said, uh, um, you know even you know saying okay, no security is now not this background thing that's going on. It is the center point. It is our existence. It is keeping us out of the news. It is you know keep uh, you know keeping uh, keeping from uh, you know losing our jobs. So uh, I think that's I think that's really important that you highlighted that. Yeah. That's really true, Corey. Uh, again, five years ago, if people asked you what you do for a living and you told them security, they would ask you security, IT support. And I would say, no, no, like I'm not an IT support. Nowadays, you tell people you do security and you're the coolest guy at the party. So right. the, uh, the, tide <laughs> certainly has, uh, the tide certainly has shifted. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It, it seems like, you know, the stress level, you know, the, the profile of the CISO has increased over the years, and now it's more of a board level visible role, but it seems like the stress would increase as well um, with the, the growing number of, of cyber attacks and the growing potential uh, impact of them. So, so do CISOs shoulder a lot of that stress for the company, and, and is it a stressful job? It's a difficult job because uh, making sure that the company is secure uh, is always a harder job than an attacker has. In order to defend your house, you gotta protect every single door. If you got a hundred doors, you gotta protect every one of them. But for an attacker, he needs to walk into only one of the doors. He does not need to go try a hundred doors. All it takes is one open door. So uh, the job of a CISO is complex because it touches on so many components. It touches on developers and working with the leaders of engineering to design secure code and practices. Uh, it's a influence job where you have to go convince other executives to buy into the policies. So ultimately, you know, the job of a CISO, again, five, 10 years ago, a lot of the security teams have been seen as a no team. Basically, people would not go to a security team because they would expect that the answer is no. They were they were viewed as a somebody who made dif business difficult. Right now, mm -hmm. A lot of our teams became true business partners and they became a how-to teams. So instead of saying no, they truly partner with the other business stakeholders and show them how they can do the uh, business tasks at hand, but do it securely while protecting the corporation. Right. right. All right. So, so, so that's high level, right? Now let, let's get into the day-to-day, the -day, right? What does it actually look like a day in the life of a CISO? Sure. 
So I think that uh, the day in the life of a CISO really varies, depending on the size of an organization uh, that you work for. But the good news is because the day in the life of a CISO constantly varies, that's what keeps the job very exciting, and that's what keeps it uh, super super fun. Uh, so ultimately, being a CISO, again, as I mentioned, is a risk management exercise. So every single day you come and you... Uh, you know, every single day uh, you come and you want to ask yourself a question about three buckets, right? Like three buckets of a way you pay attention. The first bucket is uh, people. Who are the people on your team as a CISO that you need to hire? What are the gaps in the people in the team that you have? And out of the people that you have working for you, how do you make sure that you support them? How do you, sure, how do you make sure you help them? That's bucket number one. The second bucket is execution and strategy. What is our IT security risk strategy and what are the biggest risks that we need to mitigate? For example, maybe if you're a CISO of a hedge fund, you're going to be thinking about how to implement data leakage prevention to make sure that documents are not stolen. And if you're a CISO of a healthcare organization, you might be thinking about HIPAA compliance to make sure that you follow the requirements in a healthcare uh, policies to make sure that you follow them. So the second bucket is execution strategy. The first bucket is people. And the third bucket, which is kind of exciting, it did not exist uh, five years ago. The third bucket is cash, money. And so as a CISO, you can either save money, you can save money by preventing the company from being hacked, or you could go help the company make money. And so a lot of the time now, it's a perfect opportunity for CISOs to position themselves as true business partners, as true uh, thought leaders to the CEO and help the company accelerate its revenue growth and use cybersecurity as a differentiator. But mm -hmm. kind of that net, the fun part about being a CISO and why I think it's a fantastic time for anybody to go into a security profession. Uh, it's a negative unemployment rate for cybersecurity professionals right now. The job is exciting and there's so much to grow even as you progress in your career and become a CISO. Every day changes. Every day is exciting. You're never bored. So that's really the day in the life of a CISO. Yeah. Well, I I, I think you mentioned you know um, sort of this this uh, you know you mentioned risk mitigation a lot here, and you talked about internal uh, sort of like you know risks of uh, you know internal data leakage. Um, I think one thing that that I think a lot of people who are just you know thinking about security, just putting on their security hats for the first time, and, and maybe listening to us now, they might not think about internal risks versus like external risks that a company you know faces. Can you tell us a little bit about like sort of the CISO's role in sort of like infrastructure for the company and like um you know you know in, in coordination maybe with the technical you know uh the the, the cto and maybe the, the 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 uh technical stack that's going on there how how does a CISO think about sort of externally facing threats versus internally facing threats um so ultimately uh it doesn't matter where the threat comes from right like it doesn't really matter where the threat comes from you just mitigate it differently because um uh, attackers, I mean, it's a cat and mouse game. Attackers are always going to try to, attackers are always going to try to stay ahead of the game. And if you think about, you know, if you think about the typical uh, attack life cycle, you have reconnaissance and scanning. So attackers want to find out what they can about your company. And then they want to gain access, maintain access, and be able to exfiltrate the data. So in terms of how the attackers do reconnaissance and gain access to your company, it doesn't really matter to them if they do it completely from outside because your developer forgot to sanitize the input and introduce the SQL injection vulnerability into the website, or if the attacker bribed one of the employees working for you and the employee was bribed or just fell victim to social engineering to reveal the password. Right. For a CISO, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a risk management component. But from the infrastructure perspective, Corey, um, you have to work with your development team to make sure that there are proper tools, checkpoints, and processes introduced into the uh, development lifecycle. And similarly, you need to work with your DevOps team to make sure that your, uh, I mean, to make sure that your servers, to make sure that the computers you use are properly hardened. But again, it really comes from a strategy, right? You first define a strategy and you ask yourself a question, what are the crown jewels? What are the secrets that you're trying to protect as a CISO? That's right. kind of question number one. 
Uh, once you figure out what the crown jewels and the secrets are, you do a catalog and inventory and you understand like what are the biggest risks, what are the biggest things. And then the reality is the approach that you would take as a CISO for a startup is going to be different than an approach that you would take as a CISO for a bank. And that would require different type of relationships, different type of approaches and different type of tools. And that's what kind of makes it again, exciting and fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? One thing when you described the, the three buckets, one thing I didn't hear in there um, is technical work. Now, obviously, you need to have technical chops uh, on the security front to get hired as a CISO. But once you move up to that level, do you still get to do any technical work or are you, or are you just managing technical people? Um, it depends on the size of a company. You know, if you're a company where your security team is just a couple of people, then uh, you're going to have no choice as a CISO but to do the technical work. Uh, if you are managing a large organization, then it's going to be more and more about you influencing people, working with people, collaborating with people. But I'm a huge believer. Like, I'm a really, really big believer that you have to know technical aspect as a chief security officer or a CTO. There are too many, uh, there are too many CISOs out there who are just policy people. They don't know what it takes to... They don't even know what a cross-site scripting or SQL injection is. Uh, mm -hmm. They can have heard of it, but if you ask them to explain it, they're not going to know. And right. I think it puts them at a serious disadvantage because, I mean, if you're trying to protect against bad guys getting into your organization and you spend all your time just focusing on policies and management, you're going to be rusty and you're going to be at a disadvantage. So I think that having fundamental knowledge, similar to what Full Stack Academy teaches you, I think it's crucial, crucial first step um, for any position that you're going to take in a cybersecurity space. And even if you become a CISO, uh, uh, this knowledge will be foundational to what you do and will make you successful. Right. Uh, you know, I want to mention also, you brought up the whole sort of CISO falling more into this business role and sort of being a team player with the execs to make money for the organization. I think that's really important because, um, you know, for, for many years, people said, you know, why, why, why get security when it's not going to make me money? It's just going to uh, prevent me from losing money. Why would a small organization want that, right? And I think that's a really negative um, thought, right? Is, is is thinking that one you can you can grow like that, and two, um, you know, given how frequent these attacks are, uh, to have that mindset, it's 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 just going to be absolutely detrimental to your organization. So I think it's I think it's really good that you brought that up. That having this sort of business sense as you move up the ranks is is really important. Uh, and of course, knowing the technology and being able to actually roll up your sleeves and do it yourself if you have to, uh, I think that's always a good mentality to have too. Very cool. Sure. You know, Alex, uh, I, I want to get into this this next question for you, right? So, so put on your CEO hat back on for a moment, right? Imagine you're hiring a CISO. What are you looking for? In other words, what makes a what makes a good CISO? Great question. So when you're looking for a CISO, I'm looking for a couple of things. Number one, I'm looking for business acumen, okay? I'm looking for somebody who would become a true business partner because a CISO just like a lawyer is a partner. A bad lawyer is going to tell you, you cannot do it. There's absolutely no way you can do it. And a CISO will do the same if it's not a good CISO. But a good CISO will tell you, here's how we can do it. Here's how I can solve your problem and do it in a safe way. So it's a true business partner. That's number one, business partner. Number two, I'm looking for good communication skills and curiosity. Um, bad guys always think about how to make systems misbehave. Developers are optimists. They assume that the user of a system is well-intentioned, that the input will be well-formed. The hackers always think about how to game the system. They think about ways to make the system misbehave. And so I'm looking for curiosity in the CISO. The person needs to be curious. The person needs to think outside of the box. I would say that a uh, true business partner, curiosity, and then the third part would be a technical understanding. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I think that no matter how big the organization is, a good CISO will need to have a great technical understanding 
in order to be effective, even if he or she is not doing all of those uh, tasks. Oh, yeah. That's big. All right. So I know um, a lot of us InfoSec types, um, we're active on Twitter. Um, and we like to, that's our, that's our platform for, for talking to each other. Are, are there any um, CISOs that you like following on Twitter that you would recommend to our viewers? So sure. So, you know, there are a couple of, there are a couple of people that I would recommend you to follow, not, not just CISOs, but just in general. So Brian Krebs uh, does a lot of really good investigative research. So Brian Krebs, uh, uh, you know, his Twitter handle is kind of how you hear it, Brian, K-R-E-B-S. He's an investigative reporter, and I always find a lot of a research and a lot of a break-in work that he does in cybersecurity just a super fun read. Uh, the second one I would recommend to follow is Bruce Schneier. Uh, so Bruce Schneier on Twitter uh, has a lot of interesting more philosophical type of discussions, right? Like uh, Bruce Schneier has a lot of interest in philosophical discussion around the human side of cybersecurity. And then the third is, um, I like a lot of a thought leadership that Phil Venable, uh, V-E-N-A-B-L-E-S does. He's a former CISO of uh, Goldman Sachs and he does a lot of good uh, thought leadership out there. That would be a couple of examples that I, uh, that I would recommend. Awesome. All right, cool. We're, we're going to get into um, show and tell, which is one of my favorite segments uh, from the show. But before we do that, <laughs> one last question um, about um, CISOs. Uh, Corey, you want to? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm thinking about it too, right? It's like not, not me personally, don't worry, Mark, but, but uh, you know, how, 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 how is someone who's in the field, how do they grow their career towards CISO, right? Like how do they, um, you know, go down that path? Like, do they start in a, you know, do, you know, and, 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 you know, is it someone who comes from a SOC in the same position as a security engineer in the same position as a DevOps? What do they need to do to kind of, um, you know, uh, rip that bandaid off and, and, and start kind of going down that pathway? So you have to be, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to take an inventory of what do you think you are good at and what are the areas that you need to learn. For example, you might be a really good public speaker. You might be good at forming relationships and influencing people. Great job. In that case, you got it covered, but maybe you need to read up on the technical aspects of things in order to really have a fully informed opinion. Or maybe conversely, you might be the best type of a ninja, like a lot of the SOC analysts and other type of people, they're gonna know the security um, techniques, they're gonna know the tools, but they're not gonna know, for example, how to persuade people, how to deal with conflict, how to deal with disagreement. And in, mm -hmm. that, case, uh, in that case, I would recommend people to, uh, to learn more about relationships, management, leadership. But I mean, the best advice would be, you gotta, you gotta build your network, right? Like you gotta build your network of people that you can talk to. And, you, and a lot of the time you learn things by apprenticing yourself to somebody great. You gotta apprentice yourself to go work with a team surrounded by people where, first of all, you enjoy being in their presence because we spend so much time in the work, you wanna be around people that you enjoy. But also, you want to always be in a position where you're kind of somewhere in the middle. You don't want to know everything because if you know everything, you're bored and you're not learning new stuff. And at the same time, you don't want to be in a position where you have to learn everything because then you are incompetent. So you always want to be kind of you always want to be in the golden middle where you learn in your position, but there are things where you're slightly uncomfortable that allow you to elevate your uh, knowledge. Right. Surround yourself with great people. Take an honest inventory of what you know and what you don't know. Uh, apprentice yourself to somebody great, and I'm confident that uh, um, and I'm confident that your dream will come true. 
Oh, that's very, yeah, that's a, it's a, I, I agree. I think, I think that you should always be learning. I think that's, that's, that's the, the, the worst mindset you hear from people. Uh, even when we interview people at full stack and we're, you know, we're looking to hire, you know, cyber instructors or, or um, whatever, whatever we, we might be doing um, that curiosity to learn is just so important. It shows that character. It allows you to kind of go down this trajectory of growth um, really in any industry, but in more than, you know, in more than I've seen in anything that I've I've worked on before cyber is this wide industry it's really breath heavy right there's so many different facets to it it's not just uh you know oh we work in this like you know this technical area and do this thing it's like no you are really responsible for network infrastructure and making sure you understand you know uh how this network works and sort of where our weaknesses is and it all boils down to risk management which really is every facet of your company right you all those doors and windows on your house that you were talking about before cool and you know, I think in terms of uh, in terms of learning, the important part is you want to go and learn from somebody who is better than you, but not a lot better than you. The analogy is: suppose you're a tennis player and uh, you want to get really good, and all of a sudden you go and you start playing with somebody like Roger Federer. You're going to be really, really disappointed because, well, guess what? Roger Federer is one of the best players in the world. There's never like chances are we're probably not going to get to his level. And so uh, you're just going to get disappointed. So similarly... Not with that know, attitude. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, you want to you wanna be the best in the world, but you no. want to go learn from somebody who is better than you, but uh, Taylor, not that widely different. So I think the same from for cybersecurity. Surround yourself with people who are at the next level. So, for example, if you're a SOC analyst, maybe the next uh, step would be a director level position versus the CISO. And so figure out this uh, letter of how you're going to get from point A to point Z. Mm, exactly. So don't go from A to Z, go from A to B, B to C, et cetera. The alphabet, pretty standard. Got it. The alphabet, <laughs> right. Alex, uh, you know what? I, I always love talking to you, Alex. You've got so much experience uh, and you love sharing your experience and your lessons learned with, with people in the industry and helping them break into this field, no matter what level, right? I think, C Corey, are, are we feeling like experts on the CISO role at, at this point? I, I think that I got a lot out of today's conversation about being a CISO and, and, and sort of the importance and, and its trajectory now into into the, the C-suite, right? Into really being an exec, you know, on the exec team. And, and, and I think I learned a lot from that today. So thanks, Alex. Awesome. Now, uh, before we let you go, I think we got you for a few more minutes. We're going to get to show and tell right and Ooh. so this is something fun right so this is where we ask our guests to do a little show and tell doesn't have to be related to today's topic um ideally it's related to cybersecurity. um but alex i think you have something cool to show us perfect well yeah. look uh, i'll show you guys uh, as you guys know a lot of a time a lot of a time what people don't realize is is they think that hacking is actually very difficult and the reality is uh, actually being an attacker and hacker these days is a lot easier than people think because there's a proliferation of open source intelligence. Hackers, just like good guys, share information with each other. They share attacks that work. They share type of exploits that they can go use on other type of companies. And also there's a proliferation of uh, cyber weapons that people could just point and click and those weapons would go uh, a hacker company. So like, let me show to you how easy it is to discover vulnerable targets just with the use of a browser, nothing else. You don't need any other tools. All you need is a browser. So I'm going All to right. share. Uh, I'm going to Corey, I'm you may have to start teaching this in your classroom. Oh God, I'm like ready to give like a, <laughs> don't try this at home kids. Here we go. <laughs> Talk. Are you guys able to see my screen? We got yeah. it. Yep. So where do people share information? You know, there's bulletin boards for people to talk about finance. There's bulletin boards for people to talk about stocks. There's bulletin boards for people to talk about politics. And similarly, there are bulletin boards for hackers to talk about different type of exploits that they can use. And a lot, all you need to do to go to those forums is just a browser. You don't even need to use Tor or any other things in many situations. So I pulled up forum antichat.ru. It's in Russian, but it's a you know, but it's a forum. And what uh, what you what you guys can see here is that hackers 
just like good guys are talking about different type of programming languages. They're talking about JavaScript. They're talking about the reverse engineering type of things. They're talking about cybersecurity and cryptography, decrypting the hashes. That means if you have a, a password, then kind of how do you crack it? So uh, it's very much an underground economy uh, where lots of people, even if you don't know how to hack, you can just go and uh, hire them. On top of it, what's interesting is you're going to see some advertising on the top. It's a real business. For example, here at the top, you see a, a banner ad which says, "I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you uh, anonymous, uh, I'm going to give you anonymous web server that you can use to go hack into uh, different type of companies." So if we scroll um, in the website, uh, the interesting part is they talk about different type of vulnerabilities and versions of software. A lot of the time, what people do is they look for an out of date software, and then um, and then what they do is they uh, go share exploits and vulnerabilities that they can use in that software. So one technique that hackers used is called Google dorking. And all it is is by entering a specially crafted query into Google, uh, you can look for websites indexed that are vulnerable by Google. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. So, so let me just get this straight for the people who are who are listening. So uh, we've gone to this forum, right? And and on this forum, you can you can browse around all these sort of different exploits or ways in that people are talking about. And so this one that we're looking at is like, hey, there's this WordPress site, which a lot of websites on the internet are, are built on WordPress. And in and, and most of the WordPress sites that have this version or this vulnerability, the thing is, is they have this sort of thing on the page that maybe Google has looked for ahead of time, right? And exactly. so now. You're going to copy this and you're going to put this into Google and it's going to like try to match that text. And so you'll be able to go, oh, well, this website has this thing, which means it must be the thing that I'm looking for, right? It must have. Sorry, that's, that's exactly it. It's a secret keyword. You go put it into Google. So I just went to Google, typed it. And for example, we discover all kinds of websites, including websites of an investment firm, where you go uh -oh. to it, you discover different type of error, error pages signaling to you that they might be vulnerable. So another example of what you can do is you can go and put this type of query into Google and Havij, H-A-V-I-J, it means carrot in Persian. It's a tool developed by Iranian cyber army. And what it does is it pulls off a SQL injection against other companies. And when it succeeds in extracting the passwords out of a company, it's going to create a website and uh, dump all the passwords. So for example, if I just click on the first result, we're going to see that somebody succeeded in hacking a good charitable organization called Epilepsy Michigan, right? It's an epilepsy foundation. And unfortunately, the bad guys managed to extract all the hashed passwords, all wow. the usernames, because this thing had a vulnerability. And what they did is they left a vulnerable URL and uh, this tool basically uh, discovered that. Yeah. Wow. So look at this. You know, you don't even think about this. You go on Amazon to go buy a T-shirt and you're like, I want it in medium and I want it blue. And you, you see your URL bar, the thing up top just change around. And, and it, it sort of like looks like almost like it's it, nothing's really happening. But the URL bar up top looks like, you know, like, like a little different. Uh, and now they're saying on this site that one of those things, like your shirt being medium in size or blue or whatever, uh, the, 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 the developers didn't do a good job at making sure that that when blue was passed in or medium was passed in, that it was truly a size of a T-shirt or a color of a shirt. It, it, they're here. It looks like they're, they're, they're just... Uh, you know, in injecting it really like being able to write whatever they want, and that's that's clearly exactly. really bad. So cool. What I'm showing right now, what I'm showing right now is called open source intelligence. You mm -hmm. use the things in a public domain, and there's all kinds of databases like a Google hacking database, which gives you all kinds of queries to type. So, for example, if you want to find a insecure web camera, which you're not supposed to see, you go and type show me show me all the websites that contain Express 6 live image in their website. And then, you know, you go click on it. Uh, and all of a sudden, you got access to somebody's private camera that you're not to see, supposed to see that shows somebody's, uh, that shows somebody's backyard. And right. all you get is from a comfort of your home and using just a browser. So that's why hacking is uh, 
so easy and that's why the profession of a cybersecurity specialist is so exciting because you can protect good companies you can protect good people from the bad guys but in order to be a good security expert you get to learn all these type of techniques that bad guys use so you can protect the good organizations and uh, right. that's why the work that full stack cyber academy is doing is so exciting you guys take people who may have had a different profession before and they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the knowledge, but they dreamed all their lives to go into cybersecurity and you make it possible. And that's a really, really good cause and a really good thing to do for um, for everybody out there. Thank you. I think so. And, you know, Corey, you're obviously your lead instructor for Full Stack Cyber Bootcamp. Uh, and I know you're a big fan of Bruce Schneier as well, Alex, who, who you talked about earlier, right? And, and that's something you really try to teach our students is, is what Bruce Schneier taught us about the security mindset, right? If, if you teach people how to attack, um, then they will be better defenders. Right. And, and I want to point that out about what, you know, what Alexander just showed us here is like, it's, it's, you know, a lot of this might seem malicious, right? It might seem if, if you come at this with no context, it might be like, wait, why would we want to do this? Well, we want to do this because somebody will. Right. I, I always like to think about the fact that security through obscurity, just trying to hide what's actually be going on. That's that's not real security. Right. And 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 if, if you don't find it as the security professional, then then someone else will. Uh, and 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 that's you know, that's also the whole idea behind open source technology. We could have a whole spinoff episode talking about that. Really, it's its own animal. But that's 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 the big debate. Right. Is is why is you know, why is Linux more secure? Because uh, it's, it's open source and everyone gets to try to break in and everyone can see the source code, right? I don't want to start a dip big debate, but I'm just throwing it out there. Think about it. I don't know what to <laughs> about it in the future. And I cool. think for cybersecurity, the exciting part is it's a mindset. And you guys are teaching people that mindset of looking at the world through attacker's eyes. For example, you could be walking in your neighborhood on a way back to uh, your home. You walk by your neighbor's house and you observe a stack of newspapers piling up on a porch. 99% of people will just walk by and say, yeah, whatever. But you, because you're a cybersecurity expert, you're going to say, that's kind of weird. It alerts potential intruders that he might not be home because there's newspapers piling up on a port. And so mm -hmm. the skills that uh, people will learn are going to be extremely valuable to success, not even in cybersecurity, but just in business anywhere else. Yeah, that that problem solving, putting those clues together, that's that's uh, he, that's what doctors do. So there you go, right back full circle, right? Is they have to give in some information, solve the case, and and there you are doing 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 some forensics. So you you officially, I will, I, I know you have the degree, but now it's official because it's come from me. I will say you are you are a doctor. So. Thank you. Well, well, guys, I know we could talk about this stuff for hours and, and keep uh, geeking out on this stuff, but um, we are going to have to end it here. That's a, that's a wrap on today's episode. Alex, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about a, the day in the life of a CISO. Thank you very much, Mark, Corey. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, great. You know, if you want to learn more about Full Stack Cyber Bootcamp, uh, you can go to cyber.fullstackacademy.com and learn more. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, uh, my DMs are open. I'm at uh, Digitize My Life. Corey, where, where can people find you on Twitter? You can find me at Instructor Corey. Instructor Corey. Yep. So. Instructor Corey. Alex, Instructor Corey. You're, you're active on Twitter as well. I'm under A. Yampolsky, and uh, people have to figure out how to spell my last name. If they do, they can find me. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a good question. Problem solving. Corey, I digitized my life. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll leave it here, and um, we'll see you next time on Breaking into Cybersecurity. Thank you so much. See you Bye. later. Bye, guys. <laughs>